Bill Bennett. No, just kidding. So we're going to be looking at chapter 5. We're at the final chapter. We're breaking this chapter up in three sections. So the next three Sundays, we'll be looking at uh, chapter 5. Today, we're talking about really my job description and the other pastors in this church. Uh, we'll then look as we move through it, verse 5. We'll look a little bit at verse 5, but mostly next week about humility and the work of the enemy. This is your adversary, verse 8. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion. So we'll deal with pastoral leadership today, humility and, and demonic influence in your life next week. And then finally, we'll jump in. Uh, uh, our brother Ricky's going to be preaching and finishing up the book. And when we're done with First Peter, we'll go right to Second Peter as we go into the, right before we get into the summer series. So that's kind of where we're going. Let me bring everybody up to speed quickly and say that Peter is an eyewitness of, of the life, the death, the suffering, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're not talking about some, you know, white, white dead professor from a college a thousand years later saying, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his ministry. Let me tell you about him. We're talking about an eyewitness who was living with Jesus and had an account of the suffering and the life and the ministry of Christ. So no matter what your professors tell you, that they know better, we, right here we have an account of someone who is with Jesus, walk with Jesus, you know, uh, worship Jesus in this account. Peter, the apostle, is writing a letter to several churches scattered throughout Asia Minor, known as Turkey, and they're, they're facing pockets of persecution, and within a short few years, Nero in Rome is going to set out and really send out a, a mean and fierce persecution against Christians. And this pastoral letter, 1 Peter, is, is a letter that Peter wants to write to these suffering Christians to strengthen them so that they would keep their eyes upon Jesus recognizing that someday Christ will come, he will return. Suffering is not the final uh, a uh, question or answer, but you know the restoration, the redemption of all mankind will be established. And this, this letter is dripping with the reality of the return of Christ and how Christ coming back, restoring and redeeming all of creation should have an impact in our life. Should have an impact in our life. He begins by talking about the security and the glorious salvation of the triune God. And then how we are to respond to that truth, chapters 2, 3, and 4. Well, chapters 2 and 3 anyway. And we are to live our lives separate from sin, dedicated to God. We are to love one another. We will live like good missionaries in a culture, preaching and teaching and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We should be in submission, we looked in chapter 3. Be in submission to governing authorities. We should be in submission to employees, we are to fulfill our marital responsibilities. And then in chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter slowly shifts his thoughts from submission to suffering. Look at that with me, chapter 3, verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. That's slander and abuse. But on the contrary, he says, though, even though that's going to happen, it's coming. If it's not already happening, he says, bless those that's what you call, that you may obtain or inherit a blessing. And from that verse forward, Peter takes what was underlying, the underlying theme of, uh, of submission and suffering, and brings it to the forefront of his letter. Suffering, Peter will say, is inevitable for the family of God. For those who worship a suffering Christ should expect suffering, right? That's the man that we follow. That's the God in whom we worship. He was crucified on a Roman cross. He suffered at the hands of sinful man. Okay? And if we trust God in the midst of our suffering, we've learned that he looks glorious because he's enough, and, and we find comfort and joy. Even, which I mentioned, Peter talks about this a little bit, even when we suffer for being stupid, doing silly and dumb things, when we get convicted of our sins, when we repent of our sins, when we turn from our sins and we are forgiven from our sins, God looks glorious. A loving God who rescues, who saves, who cleanses, who forgives his people. But Peter will say several times in his letter that we are to suffer for doing good. That when we are persecuted, let it be known that we are being persecuted for doing good. Pastor Nathan preached on that right before we... Uh, uh, before Perry last week, when we were in First Peter. And in First Peter 4, verse 12, 
Peter reminds us, he says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial while it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. We, we, we worship a crucified Christ. We worship a suffering Savior. We should expect that. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Again, the return of Christ. We hear it over and over again. Verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and uh, of God rests upon you. But, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, glory, but let him glorify God in that name. In our text... In our text, in chapter 5, what we see is Peter addresses the elders. Peter is addressing the young men and, and generally the men and women in church and the church in general. And I wanted to see this morning, as we get into chapter 5, I want to set the context for you, is that Peter is still talking about suffering and he moves from suffering to humility. And in between that, he talks about the leaders of the church. So Peter, Peter hones in on the pastoral leaders of the church in chapter 5, verse 1. And he does that through this idea, look with me in chapter 4, verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin in the household of God. So he's talking about suffering. He's talking about suffering for doing good, not for doing evil. And he reminds the church that judgment, when judgment comes, it doesn't begin on those wicked people out there. It begins in the household of God. Nathan, Pastor Nathan preached that last week. It begins with the household of God. Therefore, he writes, let those who suffer according to God's will, verse 19, not for sin and stupidity, but for the glory of God, entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Therefore, elders, I exhort you, I'm starting with the leaders of the church, Humbly accept your role as, as pastors and leaders of the church and lead because when judgment comes, judgment will begin with the leaders of the church. They're the leaders of the household of God. It starts with the leaders. So this text is about church in general, leaders in specific, and how to avoid God's loving chastisement upon his people. Now when I talk about judgment upon God's people, I am not talking about eternal damnation judgment. That's not what I'm saying. Christ paid for our sins on the cross, past, present, and future. I'm talking about is the loving discipline of the Lord to chastise those he loved, Hebrews 12. God loves us and therefore chastises his children. Anyone, the Bible says, who has not been disciplined of the Lord does not belong to him. So if you're a child of God, you know and I know, if we're honest, we've been chastised. Right? Everybody shake your head. Yes. We've been chastised. I've been chastised. Okay? And, and God's not done chastising me. I get a little squirrely from time to time, and I need to be spanked by God. That's just the way it is. Okay? So that's, that's what so he's saying. Household of God, that's where judgment begins, and I exhort the elders. Because when, 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 when there's suffering going on, if there's suffering for not doing good, we're going to begin with the household of God. We're going to begin with the elders of the church. And that shouldn't surprise the Jewish people of that day. It didn't surprise them. And his, in fact, I would not be surprised if Peter, before he wrote this letter that afternoon, whenever he wrote it, his devotion might have been in Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 9, excuse me, where God pronounces judgment on Israel through Ezekiel, and he says it'll begin in my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. So the judgment came down through the prophetic utterance of Ezekiel, and it began with the elders of the church uh, of Israel. James 3, 1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So with the theme of suffering, judgment, and humility, we're going to look at our text through four lenses, five lenses really, but the last one we'll just jump into uh, as we close. First, the man. Who's this person that Peter's talking to, and why does Peter address himself the way he does? We'll look at that. Next, we'll look at the ministry of, of these elders in the church. Then we'll look at the motive, because the motive behind the man who leads is very important, okay, very important. We'll look at some methods, 
it's not exhaustive in Scripture, but we'll see what Peter has to say in First, uh, First Peter 5 about the methods of the leaders of the church, and then finally the reward. So that's where we're going. Number one, the man. Look at verse 1 with me, chapter 5, verse 1. So, judgment begins at the household of God. Don't be judged for, you know, don't, don't, don't suffer for doing evil, suffer for doing good. So I'm going to exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. First thing I want you to notice is that Peter is not throwing his weight around as an apostle, right? He's not saying, I exhort you as the man, I'm the apostle and you're not. Okay, he doesn't do that. He says, I'm a fellow elder with you. I'm one of the leaders. Okay, I, 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 am, I am one with you. And he, and he humbles himself and he identifies with the leaders of the church that he is just like them. And I think what Peter is saying is that you, elders of the church, are subject to judgment because judgment begins the household of God. But I, as an apostle, am right along with you. I, too, am subject to judgment of God. I, too, as an apostle, am open to the disciplinary love of Jesus. He identifies right away with the elders of the church and what I will say the pastors of the church. And I'll get to that in a minute, why why the elders in this passage in chapter 5, verse 1, is really talking about the pastors of the church. Pastors and elders are synonymous. We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, I will tell you that sometimes when you have titles, titles can go to your head, Right? You got somebody at work that got a title, all of a sudden they were nobody yesterday, and today they got a title. Oh, my word. Like, get out of the way. Like, who made the, who, what happened yesterday, today? Somebody put a title on your door, and all of a sudden, you know, you think your uh, stuff don't, you know what I mean? So, that can happen. <laughs> and I have to admit, I have to admit, I'm going to be humble here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to admit, I can't say I'm humble because I just, that I'm not humble anymore. But I will tell you, back in late 90s, middle, mid-90s or so, that I got called to pastor a church. My, I was doing some preaching in a church in Ravina, and they called me to be the, I wouldn't say an interim pastor, but a part-time pastor. It was a smaller church. And I almost took the job. The reason I didn't take the job is that God really began to speak to my heart about I was interested more in the title than I was the people. It took 10 years. It took 10 years. 10 years after that before I became a pastor. I had to deal with the title, the authority given to me. Peter's like, look, we're in it together. It's not so much of your title as much as it is of Christ. And it's not so much about advancing your own kingdom, it's about advancing Christ's kingdom. Peter's saying that even as an apostle, not only is he beyond the judgment of God, but he, 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 He actually is talking about being one with the fellow elders, even though Peter, it says here, witnessed the sufferings of Christ. Now, some people say, well, you know, we, you know, he wasn't really at the site when Jesus was crucified, and and, and commentaries debate on that. But I'll tell you this, he saw enough of Jesus' suffering that he could say, I witnessed the suffering of Christ, the beatings, the, 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 the torment, the hatred, the rejection of Christ, that he said that he is a witness of the glory of Christ. Is this on? Okay. Witnessing the glory of Christ. It was Peter who witnessed what Hebrews said, that Christ learned obedience through suffering. It was Peter who witnessed the suffering and the glory, it says, of Christ, too, in chapter 5, verse 1. Do you remember uh, Peter went up to the Mount of Transfiguration when all of a sudden for a brief moment the veil of the humanity of Christ was lifted up and the essence, the true essence of the glory of God just shined through Jesus? Luke 9 says Jesus was praying and his face shined, became different, his clothes became white and gleaming, literally like lightning. The glory of Christ was radiating from the inside out of Christ and Peter got to see that. He got to see, he got, he got a, a glimpse of the preview of, of Jesus' glory in that moment on the Mount Transfiguration, but it also pointed to a glory that was to come. Jesus does not only reflect the glory of God, Jesus is the glory of God. 
If Peter was here, he would say, you know what? I saw the glory. I saw the suffering. Listen, folks, you are going to suffer, and the glory is going to be revealed. I've got a glimpse of it, and you need to know that it's coming, that suffering's not the last word of the gospel, that glory is the last word of the gospel. He wants to encourage us with that faith. He wants to encourage us. Peter, the one who denied Christ, walked away from Christ, failed miserably, knew about repentance and restoration, and now wants us to be encouraged that no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, we too can trust in Christ and be restored. And just like the resurrection from the dead, you know, we talked about this two weeks ago. We talk about it every Sunday. But Jesus rises from the grave, guaranteeing resurrection for everyone who trusts in him. Jesus reveals his glory to Peter on that mountaintop, guaranteeing the future glory to come. And that's what Peter's saying. Chapter, I, witness of the suffering Christ, as well as the partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Future glory guaranteed. Now, the word elder in our text, if you've got your Bibles open, chapter 5, verse 1. There are two biblical offices. I just want to deal with this quickly. There are two biblical offices in the church. One is elder, pastor, overseer, one person. That's synonymous. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And the second one is deacon. You find that in 1 Timothy 3. You find that in Philippians 1. It's synonymous for the same person. Okay? The word here in chapter 5, verse 1, is the word elder. It's where the Greek word is presbyteros. It's where the Presbyterian church gets their name. In ancient cultures, everyone knew who the elders were. The elders were the older men who were, who were part of the tribe, who kind of oversaw the tribe, who kind of passed on the tribal history, and they were seen as men that have been down the road before, and they were wise and faithful men. In Scripture... Te uh, it, it, technically, or, or how, what's the word I want to use? Um, um, in a strict sense, yes, yeah, the word I want. In, in a very strict sense, older men and older women can be called elders in, in a very strict sense. In fact, Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, he says, Do not rebuke an older man, that's elder, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, the older women... Very strict sense of older people. She's been down the road. She, she has wisdom. She's lived a faithful life. Treat her as a mom and the young women as sisters in all purity. So it's a matter of context. In the context here of chapter 5, verse 1, is the compact, uh, context of the office of elder. He's calling out to a specific group, to a specific people who have a role in the church. The Jewish people understood this. Elders were rulers of the synagogues. They were called elders. Okay, it was very common. In verse 2, we see another word that's being used here, if you look there with me. He says, shepherd the flock. Poimeno, it's a Greek, uh, Greek verb, poimeno, to tend or to shepherd the sheep. It's actually, Peter used the play on words, it really means shepherd the sheep of God, is, is literal translation. It is the same verb that used, that Jesus used in his post-resurrection with John in John 21, with Peter in John 21. You know the story, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Tend my sheep. Same thing. Feed the sheep. Shepherd the sheep. That, that's what that means. And it's very important. I think we need to point this out before we go any further. In John 21, 1 Peter 5, Ezekiel 9, uh, Ezekiel 34 is a long description of, of pastoring. It's never feed your sheep. It's never take care of your flock. Because it's not theirs. It's always shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd your people well. The people that belong to God. All pastors then are under shepherds. Because Jesus is the king shepherd. Okay? And the third word that we see here used of, of shepherds. You've got elders. You've got shepherds. You're talking about the same person. Is at the end of, uh, in the middle of verse 2. It says that you are to shepherd the flock of God. Exercising oversight. See that word? Oversight. That's the word episkopos, and the reason why I say that is because skopos, as you know, is the word is to see, microscope, um, periscope. This is episcope, which means they look over. So if you see here in chapter 5, verse 1, Peter's talking to the elders of the church, to this group of men who are overseers of the church, that they are to shepherd the church well, and they are to episkopos, they are to oversee and to make sure and to care for the flock, Okay? I say all that because, turn to Acts 20. 
I say all that because here at the church, that's what we believe. That scripture has final authority in all faith and practice. We believe that the elder of the church are the pastors of the church and the overseers of the church because it's used synonymously in scripture. So sometimes you hear me say pastor elder because some of the traditions we come from, we call them elders. Some of the traditions we come from, we call them pastors. The word overseer, episkopos, sometimes is translated bishop in your Bible. So it's bishop so-and-so. But these are all interchangeable words, and I want you to see that, because here we have a plurality of elders. There's there's four of us and one, uh, Ricky's, uh, um, you know, an intern elder as we are training him, loving him and and helping him uh, to the best, you know, to to his potential. Look at chapter 20 of Acts, verse 17. Now from Miletus, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called who? The elders of the church to come to him. So who's he calling? All right, you leaders of the church, come and meet me. They're the elders. They're the presbyteros. They're, they're, they're the, uh, the presbyteros, okay? Now jump down to verse 28. This is his instruction to them. Chapter 20 of Acts, verse 28. Pay careful attention, this is what I want you guys to do, to yourself and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Presbyteros, episcopos, overseers. To care for, that word care is poimeno, which means to shepherd. To shepherd the church of God. So he's calling the elders together, tells them, take oversight of the church and shepherd them well. The same body of people. So that's what we believe here in this church. That's where we hold to the plurality of elders in the church. One last issue, and I'm going to, I've already preached on this and I don't want to belabor it, but 1 Timothy 3, and, and we believe all of Scripture, says that the elders of the church ought to be male leaders. In 1 Timothy 3, 1, if any man aspires to the office, he should, be, uh, he should manage his household well. He should not be a recent convert. And you see these, these, uh, these, these words used that it should be a male leader. Now, I'm not going to get into it, but I, I have to say something. Eldership... Male eldership does not in any way mean it's discriminatory, sexist, another, another way men just want to dominate women. That's not what we believe here. That is not true. That is not scripture. No one who loves people, who loves Jesus, who loves God's word would ever discriminate against women or anybody else for that many. Any culture, any look, no matter what, we don't discriminate here. Why? Because Jesus saves all people, all nations, all tribes. Right? Okay. So, it is true also that women have suffered, and some even the men here have suffered, under cruel and irresponsible men. Discriminating against women is not uh, uh, good, it's not right, it's a sin, and it dishonors God in whose image she was made. Yet in our zeal to correct wrongs committed against them, we must not forget that God has designed male and feminine or male and female distinctions in order for us to beautifully and complement each other for the glory of God. And to deny the distinctions that some would do is destructive and dishonoring, just as bad, if not worse, than discriminating against women from anybody else. We need to be perfectly clear about women in the church. They are created in the image and likeness of God. They have all dignity and value and honor as any man. They are equal in God's eyes. That does not mean they function the same, but it does not mean that they are any less valuable in personhood and dignity. They're just different in gender roles. That's very simple. And people want to play on that and people want to abuse that. That's fine. If that's what they want to do, that's not what we do here. The differences between us are to be enjoyed, are to be explored and developed through life, not eradicated or hated. It's to be enjoyed and explored particularly in marriage. So the call of of elders for men in no way diminishes women's role in the church. I had a laugh because uh, Colleen, are you here, Colleen? Yeah. We had a little discussion this morning about women's role in the church, and she didn't even realize we were having that discussion, but we need them. They need us. We need them. We complement one another. We serve God together. They do a great job at certain things that we'll never do, and we do a great job at things that they will never do. So we are together serving the Lord with different roles and functions, but not devaluing in any way, shape, or form, all right? I have a sermon on that. I'll, for 50 minutes you can hear. Just email me. I'll send it to you. So next, let's look at the ministry. 
What are the elders to do? They are to shepherd, poimeno, the shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. That's the word episkopos. And what Peter is saying, this is the principle, shepherd and take oversight over them. And if you know anything about the image of shepherding, this is what we do. This is what shepherds do. They watch over the flock, right? They are to oversee. Ezekiel 34 says this. I will tend them, this is God talking about shepherding, I will tend them, T-E-N-D, in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. God's saying, I will lead them to a place of mountain high where there is grazing land. Then God says, they will lie down in good grazing land. I'll protect them. It'll be good. It'll be safe for them. And they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. He will feed them. So three things that pastors, shepherds need to do. Three things. One is lead the flock. Lead the flock. Take oversight over them. He writes it to Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy, let the elders rule well. That means direct, manage well. Especially those are are worthy of double honor, those who teach and preach the word. Elders are called, pastors are called to lead, direct, and govern, and manage the church. Paul insists that we are to be morally and spiritually above reproach because we are God's stewards of his house. Elders are to be above reproach. Uh, They are to shepherd with oversight. Most biblical leaderships um, fail to understand that they've been in place by God and that our job as pastors, leaders of the church is to promote Jesus in your life. Not Lou, not Bill, not Nathan, not even King's Chapel. Promote the preeminence and position of Christ over the church. He's the head. He's the Lord. He's the senior pastor. He's the chief shepherd. He's the master. He's the overseer. He's the high priest, and he's the king. He is the ultimate one we are being led by. So as the pastors lead, they need to lead and follow Jesus as the congregation follows in step with the leaders and with Jesus. That's the picture. Just like the home. There's no difference. The husband is to lead his wife in loving servanthood as the family follows Jesus. He's the head of the family, ultimately. Right? Same thing here. We are to lead. Next thing we are to do is to protect. The shepherd's job in the New Testament and in the Old Testament was to protect the sheep from ravishing wolves. In Acts chapter 20, Paul tells them in Asia Minor, to guard the flock. He says, my departure is soon, but when I depart, there will be savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves, men will arise. People from within the church are going to get all in your face. Speaking perverse things to draw disciples away from them, be on the alert. That's what he says. Now, from time to time, you might hear me discuss, point out certain teachers that we have that bible leaders scholars today that are teaching falsely that are teaching false doctrine that are into a prosperity gospel which we talk about here we don't do that i don't do that every day i'm not here to you know throw darts at all the different teachers and that's not what i'm here but i don't want to stand bill doesn't want to stand we don't want to stand before god someday and say you know we had this guy come rushing into our culture teaching all kinds of false teaching and some of your flock that i that that belong to me that i place under your care are following that teaching that that era that heresy we don't want to stand there and go we didn't say a word lord you should have spoke up you should have spoke up so once in a while we'll point things out that are going on for your good so you don't be led away by false teaching and a false gospel. So we are to lead, we are to protect, and finally we are to feed the flock. First Timothy says that the New Testament elders are to be able to teach. All the pastors in this church either teach a Bible, a community group, uh, they, they're up here teaching in the pulpit. Maybe that's not what they do regularly or all the time, but they are, to be able, they are called to be able to teach the word. Titus says, the elder must hold fast the faithful word, which in accordance with the teaching that he may be able to Exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Paul tells the Ephesian elders, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. It was Paul's job to give them the whole gospel, everything. So that's part of the job as an elder, as as a, a leader in the church. Teach the truth plainly, confront heretics and false teaching, 
confronting those who are causing turmoil in the church. I know that may be a shock to you. <gasps> no, not in church. Yeah, in church. We've had people come in and call, want to cause disruption. That's what, they're, that's what they want to do. That's what they're here for, to cause division, to cause fighting, to cause, you know, as elders of the church, we have to deal with that. We have to protect the peace and the stability of the body and uphold holiness and truth in the church. That includes church discipline, but it's for the good of those in the church. We are to meet the needs of the flock. James says, you know what? If you're sick, call an elder. Let him pray. Peter says, excuse me, Paul says in Acts 20 that we are to care for the weak and the needy of the flock. The shepherd must be available to meet the needs of the church. His responsibility is to visit, to comfort, to strengthen, to rebuke, to pray, to manage the day-to-day operation of the church. And as the church is growing, I know it's kind of empty today and people are away, but, you know, we're running 160, 175. We have maybe 11 or 12 community groups. I can't personally pastor everybody. I can't. In fact, I'm not going to because I'll just throw my family away and burn out and stroke out, you know what I mean? And knowing my nature, I probably would try to do that and stroke out, so I don't want to do that. Um, So we have pastors, other pastors, we have community group leaders. We had a community group leaders training about a month ago, impressing on them that they are under shepherds of the church. They are to to care for those 10 or 9, 10, 11, 12 people in their care. Because as we grow, as pastors, you know, come on board and under shepherds, uh, leading community groups, we want to make sure that people are cared for. Not that I have to care for each and every person, but if you're in the church, and you're part of a community group, and you're not being cared for, it's our responsibility as elders that you're not. Not that we have to directly do it, but it's our job to make sure that there's care for you. Now, if you don't want to be involved in a community group, and you just come and go, and you don't want to get involved in people's lives, you're on your own. Because the way we do it here is through community groups. That's how we care for one another. That's the only way we can do it. Otherwise, you're asking me to forfeit my family, and I'm not doing it. So be involved in a community group. Get the care that, that God wants, that we want for you, to care for, um, to, to care for you. So that's the ministry. Shepherd, and you know, oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Next is the motive. Exercising oversight, what? Not out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Motive is so important. The elders are to carry out their shepherding role, not out of compulsion. It's never good to say, I'll be a leader, I'll, I'll shepherd the church because nobody else will do it. So I might as well do it. You know what's going to happen a week later? Someone's going to call you on the phone and say, hey, can we talk? You're like, no. (laughs) Listen, I really got some really serious issues. Buck up. I don't know what to tell you. You know, that's what's going to happen. Your heart's not in it. It's a poor motive because it's under compulsion. Or this one, my mom, she really thinks I should be a pastor. Like, that's not a good motive, man. Your mom will tell you all kinds of crazy things that ain't true, okay? She loves you. It's, It's not good. Right? You know, you don't want to be under compulsion. Timothy, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, that anyone uh, aspires to the office of overseer, that's pastor, bishop, overseer, shepherd, same person, he desires a noble task. In 1 Timothy 3, when he writes that, he writes, uh, the word aspire means to, to reach out after, to strive for. The word desires, epithumia, means over desire. So what Paul's saying, if you've been called of God, there's an innate sense within you of that i got to do this i can't be quiet anymore i i've got to speak up i i i'm compelled i'm striving for i have a strong desire to be a shepherd when i started going to bible training back in the mid 90s um, i really went to be a bible teacher not to be a pastor i went because i was teaching sunday school i was teaching about five years four or five years, I didn't know my Bible as well as I wanted to. And I love the Word of God, and I love the people of God. So I said, let me go to Bible training and get some knowledge. You know, just get some scripture, have somebody else teach me, rather than me teaching people. I love to be taught. I just came back from a conference, nine plenary speakers, three days of, of sermons, morning, noon, and night. I loved it. A little overload, but I loved it. One day, I'm up at Albany Med working. As many of you know, I was a correction officer. I was working up there and doing some devotion and reading Matthew, and I'll never forget where I was. As I was reading, 
I opened up to Matthew 9, and Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, chapter 9, verse 35, and then verse 36. Seeing the people, Jesus, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said to me, that's what you will do. And I thought, no. No. And even through all kinds of uncertainties over the next few years, that call in my life, that voice that spoke to my heart, um, I knew it was God's call. That's why he says here, as God would have you to do, not your mama. You know what I mean? You know, it, what God would have you, according to God's will, according to God's plan. And when an elder is called, he's gifted and empowered by God to love the sheep and serve them because he wants to, not because he gets to. I will tell you, your pastors in this church love you very much. I love this place. I love shepherding here. We love the, the people here together. None of us are doing it out of compulsion. Sometimes we're doing it maybe dragging a little bit, but we are doing it because we love to do it. We don't serve just out of duty because only duty doesn't please the Lord. It's not pleasing to you, and it'll burn us out and poison us. We do it because we love to do it. And a church that has pastors, elders, bishops, one man, one person, uh, one role, a church that has people on the compulsion will be a joyless church. With joyless pastors, there'll be joyless church. There'll be no, there'll be no joy, there'll be no you know, excitement, there'll be no joy in the church. Edmund Clowney in his commentary writes this, the care of pastors for the flock will be appropriate, excuse me, the care of pastors for their flock will be proportionate to their care for the Lord. Love for Christ will kindle compassion for Christ's scattered sheep, the little ones for whom he died. Loving Jesus, loving Jesus' people, that's the heart of a pastor. Second motive is, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Now, it's right and good for the church to care for its pastor, to pay and to, to provide for his family, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 5. They ought to be fair and generous as possible. I am very thankful for the church here. They've been very generous and fair to the pastors in this church. Absolutely. We, we have been uh, kept to the scripture and we follow the scriptures to the best of our ability. The way God would have us. But understand something in the context of this letter. Today, being a pastor, it's easy to do it for gain. In that day, if you were the pastor of the church in Asia Minor, you're the first one they're coming for. It's not like today. TV evangelist, $3,000 suit, pinky ring, sweating on their brow, right? Running up and down. Their wife looks like they lost a paintball fight. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's not today. That, that's, that's today. That's not then. Then they're like, we're killing everyone in the church. Where's the pastor? We'll torture him first. Oh, me. I'm the pastor. I'll be like, yo, that guy right there sitting in the front. Ronnie, yeah, wonder. I'm just passing through. You know what I mean? But, but you, you die. You die. So he says, don't do it only for money. Don't be a lover of money. But, he says, serve eagerly, willingly. It's easy for people, particularly in our culture and today, to use their power and authority to take advantage of other people, to use it for their own selfish gain. In fact, if you got your Bibles open in 1 Peter 5, the word that we see in... Verse 2, not for shameful gain, really means unjust gain. It's not just simply money. It's using their authority and their power for their own pockets, lining their own goods, doing it for their self, taking advantage of others, right? Pastors are called to, to exercise authority, but not for gain, but sacrificially giving of themselves as a leader for the glory of God and the building up and growth of church, eagerly. Again, bring it in the context of 2013. Some people want to join the pastorate because they're lazy. They want to be leaders because they're lazy. That people don't really check on time cards. It's easy to sit in a church and do nothing. Stick with the amount of people you have, be done with it, come on Sunday and go home. Fortunately, we don't have pastors in a church like that. Not here anyway. In fact, not only not here with the five of us, 
but even before us. I will tell you, Phil Taylor filled this pulpit for three years. That's a, I, one thing I could say, I, a lot of things I could say, I love the man. Um, I, I watched him for years. He's a hard worker. Ed Marcel filled the pulpit, started the church. Hard worker. Worked hard. That's what he said. Do it eagerly, wanting to do it. Encourage, strengthen the folks. All right, method. Let's move on. We've got two more. And then we'll just really last one, then we'll close. Method. He says, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Peter was standing right next to Jesus when he heard Jesus say this. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over people, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And the shepherds of the church, the elders, are to lead and protect and and live the life that Christ has called us to. And one of the issues is, is the methods and the attitude of the shepherd. We're under strict orders of Christ. The church does not belong to the elders. It belongs to Jesus. And we must model that truth. Loving it, leading it. We're not kings and rulers sitting on our thrones. I know some of you are thinking that would never work anyway. I know. But I'm just saying it in general. Where you come to our, you know, beck and call. It doesn't, you know, we are in it together. We are in it together. John 19, Jesus is flogged. Jesus has a crown of thrones placed on his head. Under the leadership or under the authority of Pilate. John 19. Pilate says to Jesus, after hearing all the Jews and their, and their, and their charges against Jesus, that he was the Son of God, and, and, and Pilate turns to Jesus after hearing their charges and says to him, John 19, where are you from? And the scripture says that Jesus gave them no answer. And if you read on, it says, in the midst of Jesus' silence, Pilate, positioning for his own power and authority, says to Jesus, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? At that moment, man, Jesus is like, you know what? I'm not going to be quiet anymore. And he speaks up because of Pilate's claim to have ultimate authority and his pride, as some leaders are prone to do, needed to be addressed. And Jesus speaks, and every leader should take notes. He says this, you, Pilate, would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Jesus did not allow Pilate to think that he's a little God running around and has all the power and authority. Spiritual leaders do not have innate authority, but derivative authority from Jesus Christ, borrowed from the Lord, right? Godly leaders are more concerned, listen guys, ladies, godly leaders are more concerned of their influence on people, how they influence them for the good, for God's glory, than it is to control them and manipulate them. I speak to my own heart. Okay? I speak to my heart. God calls leaders to influence them, to compel them through their influence to live biblical principles in complete submission to Christ, who is the one who is in ultimate control. We don't have control over the people God does, right? He's the sovereign one, and we are commanded to influence those by living as examples, as Peter writes, persuading them, not mandating, not playing the Holy Spirit, to live a life that honors and glorifies God. We can't push them. We need to lead them. The imagery speaks for itself. He doesn't say, listen, you leaders, be cowboys. Get your boots on your whips and drive them. He doesn't say that. He said, be shepherds and lead ahead. Lead ahead. Now, having said that, having a pastoral position, having a, uh, you know, uh, leaders in the church, we recognize that our authority does not come from inside but comes from Jesus. But there is authority. There is authority. It's derived authority. Even Jesus in John's uh, gospel according to John says, I do nothing but what my father tells me to do. Okay? He, he even has the authority um, in John, I think it's John 8. He says, you know what? You don't have any real authority. My authority, your authority has been given to you from my father. In fact, the crucifixion is part of salvation history. Jesus was willingly submitting himself to the father who would be then crucified on the cross to fulfill the father's rescue plan of humanity. Leaders crash and burn when they believe that their, their authority is, is innate or autonomous and we can do as we please. What will guard us is recognizing that it is derivative. It is under the leadership 
authority of Christ. Authority does have a source. It's Christ. It does have an aim for your good. A leader must be very careful, living out his influence, stewarding it well with great wisdom that he might be used in serving the will of God. And I, I speak to my own heart and to anyone else in this room that's inspired to be a leader in the church. We're not to use our authority to abuse the sheep, control the sheep, but live as an example, right? We don't drive them, we lead them. And humility and sacrificial love, humility and sacrificial love are hallmarks, hallmarks for godly leadership. Peter will go on to say, look at verse 5 if you can. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. That's that word subject, remember? We've been talking about it. Be subject to the elders. Now, some of your hair may go up in the back of your head again. Subject to the government, subject to our bosses, wives subject to your husbands, young folks who are not elders, subject to your leaders. And when we talk about obedience to leadership in a church, I, I recognize that some of you here may have been abused by leaders. I, I recognize that. Unfortunately, uh, our hearts are hard and we just run toward that. And, and, and when there's abuse and we see abuse, we don't want to submit at all. And rather than just kicking the scripture to the curb. What we need to do is evaluate it and, and repent of sin and, and to deal with what the scripture has to say and not try to overcorrect it and say, we shouldn't have any leaders, don't trust anyone. There's got to be somebody that can speak into our lives. There's got to be someone who can speak the truth. There's got to be authority and, and, and responsibility to those who lead. Let's not just throw it out, but let's, understand it from a biblical perspective we need good pastors we need good shepherds under shepherds and there's a balance it doesn't mean we're perfect some of you who work closely with me know that i don't even have to tell you oh the other pastors who live closely with the other pastors we're we fail too we sin too you wouldn't tell a kid listen obey your parents if you ever see him doing something wrong don't listen to him no more you wouldn't say that or your boss now you know you can run your company better than he can but you still call to submit right <laughs> So imperfect people, is there a balance? Absolutely, absolutely. We're not required to follow blindness, submission, mindless obedience. The elders are not above questioning or even, even public discipline, but we are responsible and accountable to the community. And God has placed in the church leadership that are to lovingly care for, feed, protect, and lead and manage the people of God. And as a congregation, we are to respect the leaders of the church. I know I'm speaking for, as a pastor. I'm just preaching the scripture here. That we are to submit to and lead the church. Even when we have a difference of opinion. First and foremost, there must be submission to God. Gentle spirit and, and, and is, is fundamental to the Christian life. And here's the truth. Everything between the leaders and the congregation is about trust. Isn't it? Trust has to do with character. Character leads to trust. Trust leads to leadership. A dude can be a great preacher. He can be a charismatic personality. But if you don't trust him, everything unravels really quickly. He must love the people. His character must shine. A good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The evil shepherds abuse the sheep. And rather than feeding them, they feed on them. But that's not what God has called us to do. So yes, there is authority that has been given to us. It's, it's derived authority that has been given to us for by Jesus. But our job as a husband's job in the home is to lead his family in loving sacrifice. Laying down his life for his sheep. Serving his family. Okay? And that's what God has called the shepherds to do. And finally, last thing we see is the reward. And when the chief shepherd appears, just in case you under shepherds, want to run on your own, you want to have your own authority, you think it's innate and in you, guess what, guys? Someday the chief shepherd's coming. You're going to be seen as an under-shepherd either now or then, but the chief shepherd is coming, and you, if you're faithful, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. Do you know that the elders in this church, the pastors in this church, will give an account for their leadership. Not just in their lives, their family, their wives, their jobs, all the things that everyone else is. We are going to give an account for how we shepherd this church. Obey your leaders, Hebrews 13. Submit to them. Speaking to the congregation. For they, leaders, are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Anybody want to be a pastor now? 
Jesus is going to say, okay, we got over all that. All right, now let's talk about this area in your life. How did you feed the people? How did you protect the people? How did you care for the people? You know that attitude you had? You know that, that kind of look down on, so, you know, we're going to deal with that. Because you were supposed to shepherd my people, and we need to talk about this. Shepherding all of a sudden doesn't seem like the title is that important. Right? Now, the crown is an image that was well known in the first century Roman Greek world. They had the, the, the crown, they would, uh, the leaves worn in the head, and they were awarded to those who won athletic competition. And in using this, Peter encourages the pastors to be faithful, serving in trying times. Their victory is a sure victory. The appearance of Christ is absolutely their fading crown. What? There, it's unfading. The crown is unfading, I mean. They won't, it's not something that will come and go. Uh, Peter talks about that in chapter 1, verse 24, that unless it's the word of the Lord, everything else will fade. You remember that? Warren Worsby says this, everything, I love these words, Warren Worsby, everything in the local church rises and falls with leadership. No matter how large or small a fellowship might be, the leaders must be Christians, each with a vital personal relationship with Christ, a loving concern for their people, and a real desire to please Jesus Christ. We lead by serving. We serve by suffering. This is the way Jesus did it, and this is the only way that glorifies him. Let's be honest. Some folks, some folks, are fighting and kicking Good Shepherd Jesus. Some people here, even in this room, Jesus wants to shepherd you, wants to love you, wants to care for you, and wants to lead you, but you want to be your own God and your own savior. savior. And Jesus would say, truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief, all other people that are leading you, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that you may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. Why? Because the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Christ laid down his life. The good shepherd, the king of the universe, the ruler and sovereign one who created all that we see, came down as a person, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death on the cross, rose from the grave so that you can be saved. Stop kicking against the good shepherd. He loves you. He's not going to drive you. He loves you. Will you submit to him? Will you lay down your life for him? Will you, because he's already laid down his life for you. That's how much Jesus loves you. That's how much Jesus loves you. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd laid down his life. Do you know that? Have you experienced that truth deep in your heart? Jesus is called the great shepherd who died for your sins and rose from the grave. Jesus is called the, 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 the shepherd, the, the chief shepherd who will come again for his sheep. We read in 1 Peter 5. Trust him today. Trust him today. As the band comes up, let me ask you one more question. Maybe God's been speaking to your heart about laying down, yielding your life to him. Or maybe God's been speaking to your heart about leadership. Maybe you're kicking against the people God has placed over your life. And God's been speaking to your heart about just a general heart of submission. Recognizing that God has ordained it. God has supplied it. God has given to us that which is good, right, and just for the church. Maybe you're here and there's been some abuse in leadership. And it's scary. I want to encourage you to send us an email. We'll talk with you. We'll walk with you. We'll cry with you. We'll point you to repentance if need be, restoration. Don't allow that to stop you from submitting to the leadership which God has placed over your life. Maybe that's time and the time is now. Maybe you're here and God has called you to be a leader, a pastor, an overseer. Again, call the elders, talk with us. Let's meet, let's talk about it. And let's see what God would have for his glory and our joy. Father, just thank you for the good shepherd. Everything begins with Jesus. Father, thank you for the work of the great shepherd who came and willingly gave his life for the sheep. Lord, without him, we'd have no leader. We'd have no chief shepherd. 
Jesus, you are the head of the church. You are the senior pastor who laid down his life so that we can have life. And Father, we pray as a church that we would give you much glory through uh, the workings of this church, through the leadership in the church, through the, the soon-to-be leadership of the church. And Lord, through the congregation as a whole, may we, your people, your sheep, follow your lead, follow Jesus, so that you would get much glory, Lord, and the world will know about who, uh, uh, who you are and what you've done on the cross of Calvary. So Father, just thank you for that. Humble our hearts that we may see and treasure Christ above all things. And help us, Lord, not to be rebellious, but be submissive to you. Father, we thank you and we pray as we respond in singing and in giving. Lord, we pray that we would release any strongholds in our lives, any ways in which we, we just want to hold on to rebellion. We want to let it go and follow ultimately the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the great shepherd. And his name is Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.